Overwatch was this very successful game, global, people loved it. You know, nobody anticipated how meaningful and big the success of the game would be, obviously. When it was announced that Blizzard was starting Overwatch League, obviously everyone was very excited. I think it was initially pitched as like, you know, NFL for esports. Yeah, that's our vision for how we're going to celebrate and reward our players is build a league that is like the NFL, only global. Personally, I was a little bit worried because it sounded like a logistical nightmare. There was conversations of people being like, they have to be having a hard time setting this up. So I think over time, the league lost a lot of its personality. Like it just started to feel very bland. Well, you know, you want your team to win, right? They're gonna have to play what's better. From the viewing perspective, it was certainly boring to see the same heroes and you know, on every map and every match, right? I was not able to speak publicly about OWL while I worked at Twitch, but you better believe that I was the guy in every meeting going, this this is stupid and you're all stupid. At a certain point, I'm like, what the hell do these people <laughs> want? A frat boy culture. That is how Activision Blizzard is now being described here in this new lawsuit. The danger here is YouTube go, you know what? We don't want to be associated with you because T-Mobile don't want to be associated with you. Coke don't want to be associated with you. We were doing more than fumble in the dark. We were running into walls. Like there was just not, it was just double shield. There was no hope. In the midst of that, they were behind the scenes working on a not sequel, then sequel, everything changed kind of thing. There is a community that wants a lot of Overwatch went back and they think a lot of the magic was lost in 5 I think more and more people will start to realize maybe we did have a better. There was no need for Overwatch 2. It was a cash grab marketing scam that made them abandon the first game for years. It is kind of like a perfect storm of sh that would kill an esports league. It's insane how many bad decisions Overwatch League made over the years. It has been something like 17 years since Blizzard opened the door to a new adventure. And my friends, the wait ends right now. Overwatch. Soldiers. Scientists. Adventurers. When Overwatch was released on May 24th, 2016, it was something new. A MOBA-style hero shooter that rolled many of gaming's favorite elements into one mind-blowing offering. It felt like sort of a return to the Saturday morning cartoon heroes of like, you know, my childhood and all that. Like ability shooters are common now, but at the time that was still something that was relatively new. And I think uh, it wasn't just me, I think the gaming community in general was very excited about it. There was a palpable sense of excitement, and before long, Overwatch blew up, both in terms of active player base and the hours they spent playing the game. More than 7 million players have joined Overwatch's fight for the future. Across all three platforms, 119 million hours of the game have been played since launch on May 24th. It's so smooth, it's so fresh, it's so dynamic, it's so responsive, it's just absolutely ridiculous on every level. I mean, it, it is my favorite game, it goes without saying, this is my favorite game right now. Overwatch was designed with esports in mind. And from the very beginning, some regional competitions like Apex Korea showed us just what was possible in this new game. But all of them were eventually absorbed by Blizzard in preparation for the launch of the Overwatch League. We designed Overwatch from the ground up to excel as a competitive game. We're looking for the top players in the world and the team owners who will form the Overwatch League. There will be regular schedules, professional contracts, free agency, baseline minimum salaries and benefits, providing more stability for teams and players. When it was announced that Blizzard was starting Overwatch League, obviously everyone was very excited. Everyone thought it was going to be a huge step forward for esports. It was definitely seen as this moment where esports was going to become legit, because that's obviously something esports has struggled with for a long time. And they had this talk of like, we're going to have 50k minimum salaries, and you know the players are going to have healthcare and pensions, and you know it's going to be, it's going to be awesome. It's going to be this huge scale thing. These guys are getting paid to do this. The league minimum is 50 grand a year. Yes. And did, how high does it go potentially? Um, so there currently isn't a salary cap. So the scale is as good as, and is to me, 
demand of the players. Now, so Overwatch League, is that like, Mike, is that like the NFL? Like, is that the today's version of the NFL, only an online well, yeah, game? Yeah, Megan, this is how they've dialed it up. I mean, they're, they're now envisioning Boston playing against New York or Boston playing against Houston and Miami playing against Houston. Players flocked to the scene, chasing new opportunities and glory. And chasing a different kind of opportunity, investors began to pour in as well. Once I think the craft group came on and officially became the backers of the Boston Uprising, then it was kind of like, oh, this is big. And, and I'm pretty sure that the craft group then kind of like, you know how millionaires are, they all hang out together, I guess. And they were like, oh, I own an esports team. You should own an esports team. And they all got around and started buying and paying for esports teams. And that's when it was kind of like, oh, we have like something really, really big here. And it's bigger than I think anybody thought. This is being touted as the next NFL compared to the Premier League of the future. What's your vision for this? Is that for real? Yeah, that's our vision for how we're going to celebrate and reward our players is build a league that is like the NFL, only global. And it's going to take some time, but what will make it really easy is having great partners like Robert Kraft. As far as actually valuing the franchise. Like, what did it cost you to start the franchise roughly, and what do you think it's worth right now, a uh, short time later? It's been reported uh, within, like, the, the $20 million range for the first teams. Uh, that's fairly accurate, but that's not what you would actually pay. To you think you could sell it for a lot more than that now? Though? Absolutely. Yeah. For the fans, though, it wasn't just about the money. This was the dawn of a new era, an enormous new offering, and the people were here for it. 113 players from 19 countries have been signed, all of them with a single goal, to be crowned the season one champion. The wait is finally over. It's time to kick off the inaugural season of the Overwatch League. But it looks like the Boston Uprising are too busy trying to take the point. That's the Widow Duel 1. Again, Philadelphia Fusion always trying to come out on top. Striker, though, lands a big triple on the barrage there. The Graviton helping both supports are caught together. That's what they needed, but Carpe strikes in again. Striking down. <laughs> Felix also being removed. Carpe, what are you doing? This is unbelievable! A few kills here going in favor of the Gladiators. Another hack trying to come through from Hydration onto Agility. As we know how devastating the hack is now. This Fisher is like, get him, son! Oh, no, he's got another He's got another jump. He gets knocked back. Barrage in. This is a bit ballsy. Fisher oh. breaks him down. No one even like Fisher. Not many Widowmakers would go for this play. Yeah, but Pinewood, and he just absolutely nails it here. Even the Machine Gun. What a flick. Are and you another beautiful. I think it was initially pitched as like, you know, NFL for esports. And it seemed a little far fetched, but there was some part of you that wanted to believe that. I still remember the moment of loading up opening night. I think it was San Francisco versus Valiant or something. 300K viewers on Twitch and like the show is getting started up. And it just is hard to see that number and not be like, dang, this really could be something. Oh, the inaugural season was just un like unmatched. The energy that it brought, all the new fans it brought in, because it not only brought new fans to the game, but to competitive esports in general. Okay, I like this for the Gladiators. This is, this is cute. They're gonna try and circle around. The Spitfire, wanna interrupt this a little bit here? Where are you going? Where are you? Oh, the, the high, high ground. ground. Yeah. Oh, this is so nasty. Shawfall's chilling in spawn. I'm gonna call this the merry-go-round because it makes me laugh. Makes me happy and Shawfall switches to the winner maker at just the right time. Closer drops down and it's a day in the shooting range for Lane Roberts. But in spite of all the excitement, passionate fans and avid supporters, there were questions too. Blizzard was promising more than any esports league in history. A city-based model with home and away games, new stadiums, and more infrastructure than anything that had come before. Could they really pull it off? Uh, you know, we think with the Overwatch League and the city-based format, which is not just unique for esports, you know, a league where Shanghai plays Los Angeles in the regular season has is, is never been done in sports either. It's, it's really the first of its kind, and uh, we think it, it's, it's going to be something really special for, for a lot of years to come. Personally, I was a little bit worried because it sounded like a logistical nightmare. They were aiming very high and being able to reach to the goal that they wanted with everybody just traveling, considering the logistical nightmares. Again, as I said earlier, with the venues, with the visas, with preparations and so on, it was a tough dream to achieve. There's obviously a huge fan base out there that, that wants to engage with this content live, wants to go and attend events and feel like they're a part of the global community celebrating the best uh, gamers in the world. Overwatch is a global sport, right? Uh, Overwatch is a game that's played all over the world. That's why it was important to us to have a global league. We, we have a, a huge audience in the US, uh, but we also have a huge audience in China and Korea and France and Germany and the UK, uh, Brazil, all over the world. It was just really getting hyped up to a point of like, this has got to be bigger. And I think it 
even though there was conversations after the announcement when they got kind of quiet there was conversations of people being like they have to be having a hard time setting this up logistically and money wise and and selling it to people but in the early years the league blew up new and returning fans tuned in and fell in love with something genuinely hype is this the secret weapon for the london spitfire is this the answer to their problem as you know that's down. down again that heralds disaster generally for the fusion and carpe wasn't far behind profit with three he's killed four players now on his own and the spitfire are coming through with this one profit fights five kills on this traitor and you better believe that's enough but Overwatch as a game was struggling more and more with balance and meta issues, and slowly but surely, souring the fan base on the league. And a particularly notorious offender was GOATS. As we saw sort of season two come around and, uh, you know, players starting to really orbit around uh, a very safe way to play, we had uh, the GOATS meta spawn, which was composition that featured no DPS players. I think we're just going to focus focus on basics, you know, just play GOATS. And <laughs> this is just still the standoff between both of these teams, but London with that sound barrier looking to end this fight. Got Chatter such sustain. There's no, no one is dying anywhere on this. Bird Ring's got another grab, the second end of the fight. Going to catch several again. Follow-up still not quite there. Transcendence able to keep him alive. And now finally someone dies and it happens to be Profit. And that's GOATS in a nutshell. From the viewing perspective, it was certainly boring to see the same heroes, and you know, on every map and every match, right? You know, I I do feel like that's something that could have been dealt with a lot sooner than it was. You know, we we needed a patch, and it didn't come, for whatever reason. We do see the outlaws are going to pull out Dante's tracer. This has been some some of the things that outlaws fans have been waiting for is a good tracer player on Houston. It's Jake on the far. This combo's worked well for them before, but as soon as they see the defensive setup. They will just simply swap it away. Crucial time lost here for the Outlaws. Just letting the fans give their, uh, the fans here in the studio give their opinion. Well, you know, you want your team to win right, they're gonna have to play what's meta. Chat, I cannot Thank imagine you. what it's like to be a pro player right now. Chat to chat, I want you to think of this, okay? People and pro players scrim this meta probably six to eight hours a day. I think that after a while we realized that was maybe not really conducive to uh, exciting gameplay or at least a varied you know array of different gameplay styles so there's definitely a dark patch in uh, season two where yeah, dps were not necessary goats wasn't the only thing the community found repetitive though as the overwatch league became more and more commercialized some players and teams began to feel redundant that personal touch the magic that drew in so many people at the start was beginning to fade so i think over time the league lost a lot of its personality. Like it just started to feel very bland. And you know, like there were so many teams as well. There was like 20 teams and it was just like, do I care about team 18 playing team 17? No, not really. And even again, like I said, there wasn't much to distinguish that match from any other match. More and more people began to feel that the fan experience just wasn't the same and negative sentiments began to spread throughout the league. Some people started to question the future of the whole enterprise. I've seen people say, well, Goats is dead um, and now it's just double sniper and yeah. that's going to be terrible. Yeah. Or, oh, now everybody's just going to play McCree. Mm -hmm. And at a certain point, I'm like, what the hell do you people <laughs> yeah. want? So, in other words, you don't want them to eat all the ults in the game like D.Va? No. Okay. Yeah. Makes sense. There are these moments of regret that you have as a, a game developer. <laughs> and perhaps eating everybody's ult is one of those. But there was a big change on the horizon for the Overwatch League. Just not one that any of the fans wanted. The decision to take the League's broadcasts from Twitch to YouTube was instantly controversial, especially after reports that they left a $90 million deal behind. The Twitch deal collapses, and then what Blizzard do is a deal with YouTube to put everything exclusively on YouTube, which caused a ton of problems. Because really, you want your eSport on Twitch, if I'm totally honest. I was not able to speak publicly about OWL while I worked at Twitch for obvious reasons. But you better believe that I was the guy in every f***ing meeting going, this is stupid and you're all stupid. And it did not feel good. I'll tell you why it didn't feel good. Because that league cost a lot of f***ing money. And a year later, 11 of my f***ing staff was laid off. 
Overwatch had the highest average minute audience of any channel on Twitch. What we've learned is a couple of things. One is you need to go for the biggest audience, right? Um, and if we were to do a do-over, I would say, let's not go to YouTube or go exclusive just yet. Dude, there's, a, there's also a big change that the OS League is just gonna die completely. Like that's a, that's a big change. Guys, we've been watching the coronavirus for weeks now, uh, continuing to see the market action trade around the updates we get, but the coronavirus is also hitting eSports, as popular gaming leagues like Activision Blizzard's Overwatch League and Tencent Holdings Riot Games. Because it seems the coronavirus has spread to South Korea and more countries as well, the Seoul Dynasty homestands will be canceled. When they got word of the virus spreading, they had to speed run packing all of their stuff in order to make a last minute flight back. This is scary stuff, man. COVID struck at the worst possible time for Overwatch League. We were just moving into what was the long-term dream of the Overwatch League was to have homestands to really make this city-based model work. There's more to come after the break. What's that? I think, uh, 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 yep, it's the NYXL take on the London Spitfire. If that had been able to happen, that would have been magical for the Overwatch League and it could have been an incredibly different future from what we're seeing now because that was the grand vision. There were a lot of changes with the matches moving online. What was the biggest takeaway for you guys uh, in terms of adjusting to these new situations? Obviously being in our own rooms, you know, we're on TeamSpeak together. Uh, so it's not really as, as humane, like I would say. Despite some arguments that COVID actually extended the OWL's lifespan, ultimately it put the biggest, most interesting thing about the league on the back burner indefinitely. And that was devastating. Eventually the pandemic began to ease off. Maybe that could have been a chance to see the league return to its original plans, but instead Activision Blizzard had to deal with another sort of illness, the kind that rots companies from the inside. A frat boy culture. That is how Activision Blizzard is now being described here in this new lawsuit filed by the California Department of Fair Employment and Housing. The agency alleges that male employees play video games during the workday while delegating responsibilities to female employees, engage in sexual banter, and joke openly about rape, among other things. So they're making the girls do all of the work while they talk about rape and harassing them. I saw a lot of people just want to boycott the league when that news started coming out, all of the internal Blizzard struggles. It really just did more damage and the sponsorship end as well. We had all these different sponsors and now poof, it's all gone. The danger here is YouTube go, you know what? We don't want to be associated with you because T-Mobile don't want to be associated with you. Coke don't want to be associated with you. Brands like that were not putting money in anymore. And of course that's going to hurt, you know, the bottom line. If you've got teams all around the world and you're spending money to bring DJ Khaled to perform at your finals and sponsors are pulling out because of the news that's breaking that your company might've been like an absolutely horrific workplace for women to be in. I don't understand how you could then keep an expensive esports league up while that's going on. For a long time, I think they've just been a horrible company. They have not been that golden age blizzard people like to pretend that they still are. It is a company that is so far out of touch and so corrupt that it's gross. It was, it was a bummer. It was a bummer to see, you know, that happen to Lee because, you know, as far as I'm aware, you know, that part of the whole machinery at Blizzard Activision didn't really deserve that hit, you know, so. They certainly felt the effects, right? The sponsors leaving through, you know, no fault of their own. So I think they were, they sort of ended up being kind of like secondary victims to the whole situation, right? Where, you know, they were also very negatively affected by all this happening. And what's even perhaps more sad to acknowledge is that a lot of devs that you might find to be heroes, I find to be heroes of mine, may have known about this all along and maybe even participated in it. It's horrible and, uh, even as public outrage over the harassment suit and internal demons threatened to tear Blizzard apart, players were getting fed up with the lack of meaningful changes. Worse yet, Blizzard seemed to be focusing on Overwatch 2 instead of looking for ways to improve the original game. They were moving over to the D.Va, just going to be duplicating that up, but Jexa now finally unleashing that support on Ultimate. He was saving. It's more than enough to try and clear them away, and Violet falling means there's going to be a lack oh, of no. heals. That self-destruct as well. Maybe this is going to be a hot take, I think this shit is the worst thing to happen to Overwatch. This shit is up. 
It is not fun. It is not skill. It is fucking bullshit. It is dog shit. This is so bad. I don't know, because people are gonna say, oh, what about Brig release? Or what about fucking uh, goats? Or no, this is so bad. There was no lights in that tunnel. Like that, that tunnel was pitch black. We were doing more than fumble in the dark. We were running into walls. Like there was just not, it was just double shield. There was no hope. There was no communication, zero, nothing at all. And once again, Blizzard seemed fixated on the wrong problems. Overwatch has always been played with two teams of six players. Overwatch 2 will be played with two teams of five players. Holy shit! I think it's gonna suck in the long term for off tank players because inevitably it will mean that we're probably gonna see some tank players getting shafted and, and gonna be losing their jobs in some capacity. I would say it looks better than it did before but there's a long fucking way to go. There's no way that this is the work that had been done in like two years. There's just no way. A lot of people were just kind of frustrated in losing out on what we had in Overwatch 1. One of the biggest draws that they had for the game was the fact that it was a 6v6 arena shooter, not a 5v5 like every other you know game out there has is, is kind of been. So I think there's a lot of disgruntled people losing out on things like that, not wanting some of their favorite characters to be reworked because you know, you might have to learn a completely different play style depending on what hero you like to play. You're literally cutting an entire role. It's like baseball being like, now we don't have a shortstop. All of a sudden they cut a role out and teams have to adjust. There is a community that wants a lot of Overwatch 1 back and they think a lot of the magic was lost in 5 5 Whether or not that can be fixed with tanks being updated or supports being nerfed, we'll see. We'll see it in the next year. Like if, if, it does, if it doesn't get better the next year, like I think more and more people will start to realize like, maybe we did have a better. And even when Overwatch 2 did come out, the promised and highly anticipated PVE mode never materialized at all. The player base started to spiral. With everything we've learned about what it takes to operate this game at the level that you deserve, it's clear that we can't deliver on that original vision for PVE that was shown in 2019. There was no need for Overwatch 2. It was a cash grab marketing scam that made them abandon the first game for years and just try to cash grab reskins, an upgraded shop. Anybody who tries to tell you that this has not been the biggest manipulation and scam in multiplayer gaming history is lying through their teeth. Crisis after crisis had eroded the foundation of the Overwatch League. A lethal combination of unrealized potential, unfulfilled promises, and unrelenting monetary issues threatened to snuff out what was supposed to be the most important thing esports has ever done. As reports of mass layoffs on the esports side began to surface, it was time to admit that the death of the Overwatch League was no longer an if, but rather a when. More so than anything else, the legacy of the League is going to be, uh, as sad as it may be, a legacy of failure of doing, as an American say it, biting off more than you can chew, really. Um, maybe going a little bit too big without really having the framework, the infrastructure, the management. I mean, I've, I've heard so many horror stories about Overwatch League management, you know, whether it's the orgs or the teams. And I think that, like, obviously it's, it's a bit of a caution that, you know, you need to make sure that you have the foundation, the fan support, uh, the teams, the leadership that you need to be able to run something this big. It doesn't help that the league was only in place for two years before a global pandemic happened. Like it doesn't help that in the midst of that, they were behind the scenes working on a not sequel, then sequel, everything changed kind of thing. You know, it is kind of like a perfect storm of shit that would kill an esports league. Now, it didn't seem as if Blizzard was ready to announce its plans for Overwatch esports at or around the 2023 Toronto finals, but the writing was on the wall. This was going to be the league's last Hurrah. It's probably better for the health of Overwatch Esports and probably better for the health of the players that it's dying just because the, the format in its own, it's just not self-sustainable. It was inevitable at some point. So rather the sooner than, rather than later. I think it's probably a, a lesson for people in terms of the ambition behind like what Esports is. I think that like people presumably expected Overwatch League to become like a multi-million like sports rival. I think it just can't hit the heights that maybe we expected for it. And I think probably when you start to put in buy-ins of like 20, 30 million, the return on investment was going to be difficult. Overwatch League has been a very ambitious this project from day one and a decent part of that ambition has been fulfilled a lot of that has been left on the table and you know in an alternate timeline we can only imagine what that would have looked like i think a watch league will go down as a it could have been amazing ended up being underwhelming 
because you know the idea was great that there should be a proper league for esports and a proper managed ecosystem for pro players where they feel job security where they feel safety where they can kind of grow without fear of well, if we don't win this tournament, we're, we're out of a job. I think, unfortunately, the people people are going to look at the Overwatch League as an example of what not to do. And it's hard not to look at it that way from how the league has went. I had such high expectations and high hopes for this when I, when I started. I mean, I moved halfway across the world for it. I completely changed my career for Overwatch. Um, you know, I really believed in it. Given everything that's happened with the league, you know, Team's are already pulling out, right? You know, I mean, it's probably better if Overwatch League goes away after this finals. Um, and that's, I want to be clear that that's not saying Overwatch Esports should go away. I think Overwatch Esports can go through kind of a, you know, a resurrection almost, right? Where it's like, now we're going to be able to start building things again in, in sort of a more grassroots, genuine Esports way. The Overwatch League gave orgs the option to vote on whether or not they wanted to continue playing in the current system or cut their losses, take a payout, and withdraw. They all chose the latter, nailing shut the Overwatch League's coffin for good. They are all amazing individuals and really did deserve better. Uh, unfortunately though, the power ends at B that were much stronger than them. And I think Overwatch could have been amazing in that department, but they really f and fumbled the bag and they didn't fumble it once they fumbled it and then they fumbled it again it's insane how many bad decisions overwatch league made over the years the biggest swing taken in the history of esports turned out to be a failure overwatch esports will of course persevere but the gargantuan ambitious overwatch league that was supposed to change esports as we know it is no more with this game and with its esports, you just see massive potential, but then you just see failure to deliver. And it's always from upper management positions and it's always dropping people who are on the ground actually doing the good work. But there was definitely interest. And this is what makes it sad, I think, with Overwatch League. The community remains as passionate as it's ever been. The fans that stuck with Overwatch through thick and thin are still here, cheering for what's coming next. The hype that it was generating at the start, the overall interest was so crazy. And I think with this being such a unique model, there was so much potential for it to really thrive. Obviously in the end, it was too overly ambitious and people are gonna look back at that. We knew what this league could have been. We saw it in the first season, even the second for a little bit. It could have been something amazing. And like, there were a lot of special moments that really could have blown the esports scene away and be something legendary that people would remember forever. Despite the disappointment I might feel in some aspects, it's always good to remember that it delivered some special memories and that a lot of these players aren't to blame for any of this. They worked their hearts off for this and it was amazing, it, it, honestly. Even as it goes away, I think we can all kind of cherish these memories. I think it's an esport that kind of captured some special things that no other esport would be able to do.